1993 amendments to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. New Challenges in Court Administration While viewing this program, you should have with you copies of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, your local rules, your district's expense and delay reduction plan, the outline accompanying this program, and the sample local rules and other material attached to the outline as appendices. If necessary, please stop the tape and gather these materials before proceeding further. This program was recorded on December 16, 1993 in Washington, D.C. Your narrator is Bruce Clark. On December 1, 1993, a number of significant amendments to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure went into effect. These amendments apply to all cases commenced on or after December 1, 1993, and all cases pending on December 1, 1993, insofar as just and practicable. Of course, these amendments make important substantive changes in the civil rules, but they also raise important issues of court administration. First, the new rules are novel and controversial, so there's a special need for each district court to educate the bench and bar about them. Second, many of the new rules contain provisions authorizing individual districts to modify them or even opt out of them by local rule or court order. Third, the new rules take effect during a time when, pursuant to provisions of the Civil Justice Reform Act, individual districts are implementing civil justice expense and delay reduction plans tailored to attack the particular cost and delay problems in their districts. The interplay of these developments makes this a time of great change and experimentation in the area of civil justice. But it also poses some very practical and immediate problems that each district court will have to resolve in the way it thinks best. Specifically, Individual districts will need to act quickly to identify any inconsistencies or conflicts between the new civil rules, their local rules, and the provisions of their expense and delay reduction plans, decide which of the new civil rules, if any, they intend to modify or opt out of by local rule, draft and implement the resulting new local rules, modify existing local rules and expense and delay reduction plans where necessary, and ensure that members of the bench and bar are familiar with all resulting changes in local practice. With us today to discuss these issues, primarily within the context of the new discovery rules, are Judge Patrick E. Higginbotham of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, current chair of the Advisory Committee on Civil Rules of the United States Judicial Conference, Judge Sam C. Pointer, Chief Judge of the United States District Court for the Northern District of Alabama and past chair of the Civil Rules Advisory Committee, and Judge William W. Schwarzer, Director of the Federal Judicial Center. Judge Schwarzer will moderate the discussion. Let's begin by identifying the major problems that confront the courts at this time. The problems arise because uh, quite a number of new federal rules have been adopted that make significant changes in the procedure. In addition to that, the last round of civil justice reform expense and delay reduction plans is now being implemented in a number of courts. All of that's taking place in a context of local rules that exist now and the standing orders that many judges have that govern the procedures in their own courts. So some of the problems that courts confront are these. First, the question of the application of the new federal rules to pending cases. And the order of the Supreme Court provides that these amendments were to take effect on December 1, 1993 and shall govern all proceedings and civil cases thereafter commenced, but also insofar as just and practicable, all proceedings and civil cases then pending. The second source of problems is the fact that a number of the new federal rules give a local option to courts to permit them to vary the rule, either by local rule or by order in a particular case or in some other fashion. 
The third source of problems arises from possible inconsistencies or perhaps even conflicts between local rules and the Civil Justice Reform Act plan of the district. And I believe, Sam, that you recently had occasion to observe an illustration of that. Uh, Bill, I was uh, in one district here very recently and was looking at their local uh, CJRA plan and their local rules and having a discussion. And they said uh, in their local rules, uh, we disavow, we do not adopt uh, 26A1, the initial disclosure. Fine. However, then you go and you look at their CJRA plan. And in the CJRA plan, they called for people to appear at a scheduling conference and to have with them at that time a list of potential witnesses and a list of potential documents. So, in fact, what the CJRA plan did was simply adopt a variant of 26A1 without really sort of realizing that's what was happening. And I saw a lot of uh, similar illustrations with that in some other districts. So, so that puts a premium on uh, making it clear to lawyers and judges what the rule is going to be and just what's expected of people. And we'll be talking about that in a minute. Uh, and the final complication arises from the fact that in many instances individual judges have their own standing orders which creates an additional potential of inconsistency if not conflict between the plan and the newly adopted national rules and perhaps even local rules. So obviously there is a, a premium on paying attention to the relationship between the CJRA and the local rules. And Pat, do you want to address that uh, issue? Well, it's very important uh, for the judges to, the local judges to keep in mind that uh, lawyers and uh, both out of the district and locally need a central repository to look to in order to locate the, the rule. What is the applicable rule? Particularly in a period of transition, they'll be looking for the rule. The CJR plans themselves may not be the best vehicle to express the uh, or to capture the, these rules. It may be a better practice to state in local rules and <clears throat> all of the rules that will control uh, your, the operation of your court and leave to one side the CJRA, plan, CJRA plans themselves as a repository of rules. That has a number of benefits. So CJRA plans are often stated in very general language. They do not deal with the specifics of discovery that the judgment in the local court may want to deal with. Bottom line is that uh, don't rely upon the CJRA plan itself, but rather go to rules and have them stand on their own bottom might be the better course. Uh, obviously, in some districts, the CJRA plan in more detail, but even there, if you have a set of rules and the rules control, that tells everyone that's what you look to. CJRA plans are not uh, always available on Lexis or other places for research. In other words, that seems to me that with this now that we're confronted with a lot of choices, uh, my reaction to it would be to choose the rules. That's the familiar place to look for these things. And I've certainly heard lawyers express great uncertainty over just what the legal status is of a plan and whether it represents an enforceable set of rules uh, and how they relate to the local rules. So I think well, that exa that's... Exactly, because you, you, they say, well, gee, is it, what's Congress doing about the CGRA plan? This, you know, what, what, what's, what's the real effect of that? Uh, what's a plan? Is a plan a rule? Uh, it seems to me that, uh, that the way to resolve that for all the people who will be concerned about it is to go to rules, and even though you, you have some repetition, by, almost by definition, uh, the lawyer, you, you hand to the lawyer the set of rules, these are the rules that control the court, and they don't have to go chase it down in a plan somewhere. Yeah, I think it's better if the lawyers do not ever have to go and look at the local CJRA plan, and whatever is going to actually govern the way they deal with their cases is going to be contained in the local rules, even if it's a, a duplication, but at least you don't have to go chasing off to something that's hard to read and uh, not always available. I think that's a very important point. And another point courts might consider as they go about looking at their local rules in the context of this particular situation now is whether all of those local rules that they have now are really needed in light of the very particular provisions that are now found in many of the national rules. 
So if there is, for example, a local rule dealing with uh, expert disclosure, uh, the court might want to look at that and see whether it's really needed, apart from the question of conflict or inconsistency, whether it's really needed if the local rule is permitted to go into effect. Well, uh, obviously in this situation, courts are going to need to think about adopting local rules that deal with some of the specific subject matter that is in the new national rules. And we're going to move on to looking at the particular subjects and how they might be addressed in local rules. And you have received, uh, together with the, this videotape, uh, some draft generic rules that might be helpful in starting out on that. And Sam, do you want to launch that discussion? Yeah, I think first it's important to understand something about the actual adoption uh, of local rules. And you really are directed here towards Section 2071 of Title 28, as well as uh, Local Rule 80 or National Rule 83. Uh, it, there's a contemplation that before you have a local rule adopted, you will one have an advisory group that considers the matter. Uh, the court's not bound to accept what the advisory group does, but then there'll be a proposed local rule that is published, available to be looked at an opportunity for the members of the bar and the public to comment, then the adoption by the court or the modification. It then can take effect at that point, but copies are sent off to the judicial circuit and to the administrative office. Uh, that's the typical approach contemplated in the national rules and the statute. There, this process, however, particularly as it relates to these rules, could be a problem because some courts need to do something very quick and do not want to wait for that full process, uh, particularly as to those rules that have just come into effect. Uh, under Section 2071E, a court can adopt local rules without first going through that publication and comment uh, phase. Uh, if they, That's on the basis that there's an immediate need for adoption. Uh, if you do that, then However, you should, after that's been adopted, uh, really as a temporary measure, then go through a process of publication, get comments, see if you need to make any changes. But you can go ahead and actually adopt without having to wait for that period of public comment and the well, like. Well, can a court shortcut all of that by simply adopting a general order, do you think? That certainly would be one uh, possibility that probably has the same effect as adopting this local rule without any prior uh, notice. For an the emergency. Yes, but the difficulty then is this is a potential fourth source of confusion. And now instead of just having national rules, local rules, and CJRA plan, now you have a general order. And so you then are going to have one more thing to untangle. So I would recommend to do it by local rule rather than general order. It sounds like this is a true opportunity for the local courts to do some pruning of some of the old rules that they come up with a set of clean rules and almost to start afresh as best they can because it now have the real difficulty, as you say, the, with the four different sources and then you have individual judges uh, within, a, for example, a large metropolitan district who, who may have some, their own set of, of rules to govern their court. If we keep multiplying that, so we create a, a very complex uh, procedural array to confront any litigant that comes in. Uh, pruning may be a, there, which yeah. may be a real opportunity. I to think do it's something. a good idea, and we may get into some things as we go down the specifics on how to do that. There is the problem that, particularly for courts that have very elaborate local rules, uh, the process of pruning could itself in, uh, involve yes. a lot of work which maybe they'd rather go ahead and do something to address the immediate problems rather than getting the pruning well, I, right that, now. Uh, well, I was thinking about a, a short-term solution by order or you talked about or some other intermediate step, but the court then looking for a longer-term solution to the problem of commencing the, mm -hmm. the re-examination of its local rules. Well, you know, now that all the Civil Justice Reform Act plans are supposed to have been completed and the advisory groups have done their job, this might be a good time to invite an advisory group to examine the local rules and uh, ask them to <laughs> take a look at it and whether they can be proven. Well, let's move on to the next yeah, section. Uh, we're, this is supposed to be non-controversial, <laughs> what we're doing here. Uh, as Bill indicated, there was sent out uh, with this videotape 
uh, some materials, and one of the, the items is would be three sets of sample local rules. That is, how local rules could, one, uh, how they might look if you didn't want to do any local variants other than specify what cases they apply to, but otherwise you adopt the national rules. A second variant is uh, you don't want anything to do with initial disclosure. You want to opt out altogether from any kind of initial disclosure. So we have a sample set that will show how that could be done. And third, the, the court might want to have something which it has local variations. It wants to change the scope of initial disclosure about documents. It wants to change something about the time of the meeting. Uh, and so we have a third set that could be used as a guide for courts to look at uh, in doing this. There are, I think, three major things that in all of these rules uh, are important to look at. One is to try to deal with the effective date problem. That is, as you said, Bill, uh, it applies to all pending cases on December 1st to the extent just and practicable. Well, you c there's an option for the local rules to say what is just and practicable, how do we want them to apply. So the first thing is the effective date. The second thing is to see what categories of cases you do not want a particular uh, type of new provision to apply to. That is to exempt certain cases from a particular requirement. And then the third part of the local, any local rule is to decide if there are any local variations that you want in your district where that's permitted and uh, to fashion that. And these three samples try to illustrate how you could do that. Maybe I can best get into it if I take or start out with what I believe is the, uh, the functional way to approach local rules. At least this is what I did when I got involved with our own local rules. This is going subject by subject. Subject by subject. The first thing I would look for in deciding on the local rules would be to identify the cases in which there is to be no formal discovery without court permission. And that's going to be social security cases, uh, government collection cases, uh, whatever, but cases in which you're not going to have discovery uh, ordinarily. And because this is going to be important because then those cases are going to be also carved out of any requirement for a meeting of counsel or disclosures, anything of that sort. Well, correspondingly, Sam, you would have a, 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 a sort of a parallel carve out uh, dealing with the prohibition against uh, the uh, taking discovery at all that, that obtained. In other words, under the present rules, of course, 26D, you, you cannot even start discovery until they have the meeting of counsel, but then under 26F. But uh, we have the problem that there are certain ca uh, cases, emergency cases, which uh, perhaps ought to be exempted from the operation of that prohibition against discovery. So when we're, we're talking about uh, these exemptions, uh, we can just, one of the parallel provisions would be look at 26D. And uh, I noticed that you prepared a, a uh, suggested, uh, one suggestion that, in the, that the, for the judges in 26.1C, uh, uh, the language of exclusion that uh, that might deal with certain categories of cases that that is on these sample forms that are right. being sent yeah. out. Uh, right. Twenty six point one C two uh, right. shows some language about this problem of when to commence discovery. The TRO routine case uh, those kind of cases and emergency matters of that sort uh, where the parties are going to have to launch discovery immediately. Uh, <clears throat> one would contemplate that they might and the court would examine those by category. If they don't treat them by rule or category, then the result will be that either the parties by stipulation agree uh, to do it or they'll be right immediately back to the court. And if you're going to anticipate that problem in a by category of cases, maybe that's the way to do it is by rule. Okay. And 26C1 would yeah. be the... Yeah, uh, my suggestion is no more you start with trying to find the case in which there's not ordinarily going to be any discovery without the court's permission. The next place I would suggest is that you then decide what cases, in addition to those, do you want to exempt from the requirement of the meeting of parties. That's uh, a 26F. This, that's 26F. This is where 
the national rule says that except in categories of cases exempted by local rule, the parties are required, that is the attorneys, are required to meet and to talk about the case, talk about potential discovery, and submit a report to the court. Well, Sam, I would think that the, <clears throat> that, that category would be narrowly defined because uh, it, it, I read the, the rules, uh, the meeting of the parties is such a critical point of the whole discovery uh, rules here that uh, it would seem to me that uh, we ought to be very careful about uh, cutting the lawyers loose from that basic obligation. I don't see anything bad about lawyers meeting if, if they have the opportunity to do so. It's so only if, in other words, if, it, if it, given the nature of the case, it's just not practicable for it to occur, would I, be, would I want to entertain some kind of exemption? What do you, what do you think? <laughs> well, I agree that you should be, uh, that it's preferable for the local rule to be very narrow in what cases are exempt. You want to exempt those in which uh, there's not going to be any discovery. Right. You don't want a meeting of counsel right. there. Number two, I don't think you want a meeting of uh, parties in a pro se prison litigation, even though there may be discovery <laughs> in that. <laughs> Plaintiff uh, plenty may want to meet. That's right. Uh, there may be some uh, cases of a particularly complex nature that you would want to exclude from this requirement, or certainly if the case is consolidated with one, and there's already been that kind of meeting in a scheduling order, you don't want to have a requirement for an additional one. Uh, the people might want to look at 26.1 in these uh, sample rules that were put out. 26.1D is some suggested language about uh, this exemption about the meeting of parties and the uh, cases that should be exempted. And that goes along with this matter about the categories of cases that should probably be exempt uh, from any discovery without court order. That's in 26.1B1. Uh, there is, however, a, a good reason to consider local variations on this meeting requirement. Uh, such as to change maybe the time of the meeting. You mean like accelerate it to, yeah, so that discovery a, could occur A special earlier. time. Yes. And, uh, for example, in uh, our district, uh, we require that that meeting be held within 45 days after the first appearance of a defendant, which is a little different from the national rule. You could have a change as to the time that the report is to be given to the court. Maybe the contents would be different. You might want to consider giving the parties the uh, opportunity to agree to conduct the conference by telephone, although I'm frankly leery of doing that. In our local rule, we say if their principal offices are more than 100 miles apart, then they can agree to do it by telephone, but otherwise we want a meeting. A yeah, telephone, telephone conference might invite a sort of a touch the base and run well, we've done that, and let's get on to it, and yeah. not really achieve the purpose. Let's talk about the presumptive limits, Pat. Uh, the, uh, the national rule provides for limits on depositions and discovery unless the court uh, exempts uh, the particular case or grants additional leave for additional discovery. Uh, what about uh, treatment by local rule of that matter? Well, one of the... Uh, practical problems that will immediately <clears throat> jump up, I think, to the district judge is that is the reality that, that these uh, presumptive limits on the numbers of depositions, the numbers of interrogatories are simply not uh, workable with uh, certain categories of large cases, and are where they intended to be under the rules. Uh, those are, as we say, presumptive. Those are the default rules. The problem that we have to try to identify by rule the types of cases in which uh, those kinds of limits are simply not applicable. Uh, certain kinds of cases come immediately to mind defined along substantive grounds. You, 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 so we immediately start thinking about antitrust cases and class actions and uh, larger kinds of cases uh, that uh, where this would not obtain. Uh, I think that's going to be an area in which the, the court's going to have to give a lot of thought to and particularly drawing on their local experience about what cases truly do present those kinds of problems. Complexity is many times a local definition. You deal with maybe a maritime matter in, in New Orleans is quite different from a, from a products liability suit in, uh, in Houston, Texas. Or the, the local variations are such that I think the, the, we, they're going to have to draw on those local on their own experiences about how to categorize that. But the, 
The main point about it uh, to me is that um, there is the opportunity to, to define by rule those categories of cases where you know from the outset from your own experience that these limits are not going to be a problem. Keeping in mind, however, that, that the meeting of the parties themselves we keep coming back to that meeting of the parties yes. themselves, should take care of a lot of these problems. So I, again, I would, I would be hesitant, I think, if I were doing it, to, to draw that rule expansively. I would, I would think only in those cases where it's very clear you know that case after case, that's just not going to be a, uh, those presumptive limits are not applicable, would I would reach for a rule because I would leave to the parties in the case when they're first meeting to come back to, with me to the suggested scheduling order to take care of that. And so I think a lot of them will go out that way. We have in the 26.1b2 uh, in your materials uh, suggested uh, uh, possible ways of, of dealing with the presumptive limits on the quantity of formal uh, discovery and, and particularly uh, numbers of depositions, lengths, and such as that. Now, the matter of lengths of deposition is not in the national rules. If a court wants to have that, it can do so, but would need to do it through the local rule. Yeah. Same thing is true with uh, Rule 34 request. And Rule 36, nothing in the rules nationally, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a power of the court through its local rules to. Sam, do. what do you think about the time limit on deposition? There's a lot of talk about that, and as, as another limit uh, that uh, might be in, uh, presumptively applied by a local rule or whatever, responding to what they're perceived to be. Well, uh, I favored it and voted for it in the uh, committee when we were considering the rules. I was out and voted the majority of the committee. Uh, decided they didn't want to have a presumptive limit on length, but we all agreed, and that's the way the rule is written, uh, that the court has power through the local rule to have presumptive uh, limits on length of depositions. Let's move on to initial disclosures. We found one, a of the less one that's uh, controversial. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you mean Sam's provision? Yeah. <laughs> People might want to refer to 26.1A1 in our sort of sample rules that we are sending out. It seems to me that there are three things that need to be dealt with. I suppose the first in the way of a local rule is whether to opt out altogether. And of course there will be some courts that want to opt out altogether. For those that don't opt out altogether, there is then the issue of what kinds of cases should be exempted from the requirement of initial disclosure? And that presumably would be the cases in which there's no meeting of the parties required, certain specially complex cases, perhaps class actions, you wouldn't require the initial disclosures to be done. Product liability cases? Uh, I would uh, still have the products liability, absolutely. Now, they could come if they can't agree on yeah. with disputes over scope. But uh, well, some of the products cases, again, might be a very mine run lawsuit for the lawyers. Yes. Now, one of the things is uh, any local variations. And it seems to me, just from what I'm hearing, is that most courts that are allowing 26A1 to go into effect have adopted local modifications. I mentioned earlier, Bill, the, the district that said they were doing away with all initial disclosures, but then in effect, put them in by requiring a list of witnesses and documents at the time of the scheduling order. Uh, so it's a form, that's a local modification. In our particular district, we made modifications as to the uh, uh, types of, d of document uh, identification that's to be made. Uh, it's, people might look at the, one of these local, uh, one of the sets that is being sent out uh, showing a modification that shows that kind of change. Um, and finally, there's a need to decide whether you want these disclosures to be filed with the court or not. Uh, most courts provide that discovery materials are not filed, and you probably would not want these initial disclosures filed with the court. You certainly want the report from the meeting of the parties. But as it relates to the initial disclosures, I, I would think you'd probably not want it filed, until you, unless it's or. Well, let's take a look at uh, Rule 26A2, Pat, that requires uh, certain disclosure of expert witnesses and testimony. Well, 26A2, of course, uh, really builds on a, uh, the experience that had been out there for some time that many uh, uh, district judges were employing, and it, it makes choices among those practices. And 
comes up with a with a, uh, a technique or uh, a presumptive technique, if you will, or of our dealing with these problems. The I think one of the questions that the district, district courts have to deal with now is the question: What local variations from those uh, 26A2 uh, disclosure requirements uh, ought they to think about? If you look at the rule, uh, you will see the, uh, the the rules requirements there for disclosing the written statement of the of the expert, uh, the insistence on the detail with that report, etc. The you also see that the rule sets out the time and the sequence in which that will occur in terms of the overall lawsuit. Well, certainly, the, uh, the, locally, it seems to me, the court might look at the time and the sequence of disclosure, when those reports will be filed. That it, and I'm talking, of course, about a possibility of dealing with it in, by a rule, now, in an, in the, obviously in an individual case, you know, with a, it's sufficiently complex that the court is dealing with it as a managed case, or uh, the, the time and sequence might very well have been have been varied. Uh, the general message of the rule is to encourage the the uh, district courts to to look at at these particular this particular problem on a case by case basis. Except uh, for the disclosure of the identity of the witness, I take I, it. I think that's, that's probably right. I, and, yeah. and except I think it's the time and sequence. I think that the way the rule is structured. Uh, the national rule contemplates the, this particular discovery mechanism, that is, that the expert has got to produce his, his report and you lock him into it. Uh, but as to the time or the sequence that's of the, the... That's the expert who is specially retained yes. or employed. The it's not, 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 it, it's not, not somebody like the treating physician no. who right. didn't have any choice about whether to become a witness. Yes. Uh, you know. right. This is a professional witness, uh, uh, if you will, and it seems to be a, a very, to me, a very sound balance of the two. But the, for, for our purposes here, it's the timing and the sequence of those disclosures that that we would look to as possible subjects for treatment by local rule. Okay. Do you want to say something about the final pretrial disclosure in 26A3? Yes. Uh, rule 26A3 calls for certain disclosures to be made uh, in a, shortly before trial in terms of the actual witnesses at trial or the uh, actual uh, exhibits to be offered and then uh, calls for objections to be raised if there are any uh, to those uh, documents. This is what courts have uh, frequently done either by their final pretrial orders or by local rules, and now it's being supplanted really by a national standard. Uh, as I view it, there really is not any option to, uh, to opt out of this uh, for the court as a whole. Now, certainly on an individual case basis, you can do that, but I do not see this as one where yeah. the district can just say, we don't want to do this. What it does mean, though, is that courts probably need to look carefully at their present local rules because their present local rules frequently have something about this same subject, the final disclosure of witnesses uh, and exhibits and how that's to be done. And probably those uh, matters either be abrogated because they are being supplanted or at least be checked to make sure they're not inconsistent. That could be a real problem because the national rule now provides for the waiver of the objection. Right. And you can have a local rule that covers the same subject matter but says nothing about a waiver of the objection. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's another source of conflict is a lot of, a lot of judges uh, have their own set of rules. That is, each court has a set of rules and very tailored to their particular desires. And uh, they're, they, well, most judges are very proud of their own set of rules. But it, it seems now that this is going to be another source of confusion. Well. I think it is, particularly if a judge tries to use what might be called a standing order, yes. something that is used in all cases without actually being entered in that particular case. Now, if the, the individual judge does something in the particular case that defines what's to be done, I don't really see a problem, man. I think the power is there. And, and the lawyers will know what's expected if right. the order is directed at that. Where the problem is going to come is if, if a judge has this standing order that yes. doesn't go with every case and that is somehow inconsistent, perhaps with national rules, <laughs> local rules, CJRA plan, uh, what do you do? Uh, yeah, you need another hand. Yeah. But. Uh, just a word about the duty to supplement uh, in 26E substantially enlarges the present duty to supplement 
discovery responses and disclosure responses. Uh, and that also seems to me uh, like a rule that creates a categorical duty uh, that is not expected to be modified Except by local maybe rule. as to the time when somebody should yes. report the seasonably any, supp uh, any supplementations. Right. You can certainly define that by court rule as well as by order in the particular case. Oh. <laughs> Sam, there are a few other uh, rules that uh, might be, in which changes have occurred that might be inconsistent with present practice. Yeah. Do you want to touch on those? Yeah, I think that in going through the local rules to look for adopting these new ones, you have to be looking for where there are existing local rules that are going to be inconsistent or at least create possible conflicts with these new rules, new local rules. But there are also going to be likely some local rules that really are outdated and obsolete in view of other changes in the national rules, either the ones that went into effect uh, December of 93, or indeed the ones that went into effect December of 91. Let me give you several illustrations of things to look for in the local rules that might be obsolete. One would be uh, the ones dealing with the size of civil juries and alternate jurors in civil cases. That's been essentially superseded by a national rule on the subject that took place two years ago. The issue about how you apply for attorney's fees, when and how, and there's so many local rules like that. That basically has been superseded by new rule 54D and probably should be eliminated unless there be inconsistencies. Decorum at depositions, uh, the matter of interrupting questions and leading uh, su suggestive objections is a matter covered in many local rules. Again, there's now a national rule, and so the local rule probably ought to be eliminated. Sam, come back to uh, for a moment to, to Rule 54. That yeah. strikes me as a change that, uh, that it's going to implicate a lot of uh, daily routine work of the district court, uh, and that is that now dealing with the question of attorney's fees and the timing of them and the methods for handling those. What do you think uh, about the implementation of Rule 54? Does that lend itself to local rule or categorical treatment? There, there are some things that, that uh, a local rule to implement Rule 54D could be helpful on. In terms of the basic structure, when you file uh, the motion for attorney's fees, what should be supported at that point? Those things are covered by national rule. But the national rule goes on to, to effectively authorize local courts to help come up with ideas that will reduce the amount of judicial time spent in dealing with these matters, including references either to master judges or to special masters. And so at least one idea is, uh, I don't know of many judges who really enjoy uh, attorney's fee award disputes. Uh, <laughs> And you, think uh, it, gonna be it, lot, you think there's going to be a lot of references here? I think uh, the, the, local, the national rule is intended to broaden the authority of the court to develop special procedures to streamline the whole process of uh, attorney's fees. Well, one thing that certainly bears mention, it seems to me, is, this, is the addition of the provision of the, it gives to the district judge the control really over the timing of the appeal. It's an unusual provision, but, but it's intended to to make his workload a little easier. And, but he has to make a, a, a threshold decision as to whether or not uh, this case ought to go forward on the merits as well as the attorney's fee issue, whether to hold it back or whether to decide a part of that issue, such as entitlement but not amount, and let that go forward. The Those, appeal. Pat, however, are going to be done on a case-by-case yes, case basis. Yes. There's no such, rule as a, no such thing as a local rule right. dealing with it. It has to be on a case specific basis. One other thing before we pass to the next subject, Bill, and that is among the rules that took effect December 1, and they apply to all cases pending on that date in my view, uh, is a matter that frequently has been covered in local rules, which is discovery motions. Many local rules have required that before discovery motions could be filed, there had to be an effort to resolve the matter without uh, meet and confer. To, uh, to meet and confer, to perhaps avoid the necessity for right. a court ruling. Many courts have had something like that. Now the national rules have it written in, and probably those local rules ought to be, uh, in effect, uh, 
what do we call the word earlier? Strip down. Pruned. Pruned. <laughs> to get rid of those things. Otherwise, you then have arguable conflicts in the actual language. Uh, it's sort of the Christmas tree effect, you know, that you hang little ornaments on the local rules and they keep becoming more elaborate all the time. <laughs> well, the meet and confer requirement is newly added to motions for protective order, too, and that's something to think about. We well, might want to move on to some let's, practical let's problems, talk get away that. from the actual uh, adoption yes. of local rules and talk about what the practical consequences are going to be to the district judges. I think one item is the question of when are you going to have scheduling conferences and when are you going to have scheduling orders? We're talking about 16B. Uh, the old rule required a 16B order in every case, not exempted by local rule. Uh, it did not require a conference. The new rule is identical with the old rule insofar as that is concerned. You've got to have an order in every case except in the category you don't exempted. have to have a conference. You don't have to have a conference. You should, in the way the rule is constructed, either have a conference or, at a minimum, get the report from the parties that comes out of their Rule 26F meeting and use that to structure the order. If, whether a, or not you if a judge issues a standard scheduling order without paying any attention to the report that the lawyers put together as a result of the 26F conference, the salutary purpose of, of 26F will be undermined. As you say, that may be the most important change in these rules and judges can do things that will make that a meaningful exercise by the lawyers by paying attention to the report. How do you see that happening? The lawyers, the lawyers meet, and that's wholly apart from the court, and then the first contact that the judge has with, with that case or, or with a, it will be really be a report coming in, I guess. And so he's got now that report in front of him. Now he's got a choice. He can decide, look at it and say, well, we really need to meet with the lawyers. I need a conference. Or this is routine enough, I can just go out and I know the lawyers and they know what they're doing and, and go on from there. Yeah. One of the things that is suggested in Form 35 that illustrates the kind of report that should be expected is an indication from the attorneys whether they believe an actual conference with the court would be helpful or not. The judge, either by taking that into account or because of the judge's own practices, which may be to always have conferences, would make a decision about having a conference, bringing the lawyers in. This, the, it can happen in the reverse, in this way. Uh, my own personal practice happens to be to use scheduling conferences before I have scheduling orders, and I do that in almost all of my cases, uh, ex except the ones that you're not going to have discovery in. Now, if I send out an order scheduling a case for a conference, that then is going to trigger the obligation of the attorneys to meet and confer under Rule 26F and in turn give me a report. So I have a great deal of control in terms of getting the case started earlier, starting the discovery earlier, by in effect having that scheduling conference uh, set just as soon as I can, as long as I have attorneys to deal with. Well, many district judges have a, a standard practice so that as soon as the they can identify, they, they know the, the defendant, know all the parties that they're immediately notified uh, for a scheduling that's conference. What and I then that's what you do. Yeah. And it, so, so as I understand but, this, then that, that practice, you still follow that practice routinely. But then the judges who have, have another practice can do, follow what they want. That right. is, they don't schedule a, a conference, and in this case, until after they've gotten a report from the attorneys, and then can make a decision whether they want to spend time with a conference. Mm -hmm. And they'll be guided, hopefully, by what the attorney's work is on this uh, report. And how to, try, and how to track the case, what, what, what track to put it on. That's right. Well, the scheduling conference seems to me to also have special utility under these rules that we've been discussing that allow for adjustment of the various parts of Rule 26, for example, to reflect conditions in a particular case. And that would be the form in which to look at, uh, for example, the procedure to be used in uh, expert disclosure. Well, in the timing of experts. That's right. Uh, changing the scope of uh, some of the disclosure thing, perhaps, or certainly changing limits on the number of interrogatories or depositions, that really ought to be looked at at the scheduling uh, conference, certainly included in the scheduling order. 
Well, and, and of course, that uh, the other uh, provision that parallels this notion of the lawyers themselves meeting on their own and discussing the case first is the is now the uh, the very strong support in the rules of stipulation by by the parties themselves. The parties themselves can, so long as it doesn't interfere with the uh, set schedule of the court or a uh, trial setting. Uh, can by agreement uh, work out their discovery, set out a discovery schedule, uh, make agreements about taking depositions, the form of them, and, and so forth. Without court approval. Without court approval. That's important. That they, mm -hmm. they, they don't have to run to the court to get the stipulation. And it, it should be a written stipulation according to the rule. But uh, so long as they've got that, what do you think about the, uh, the filing of that, uh, Sam? That should those stipulations be filed? Or? Stipulations need not be filed if the court doesn't require discovery to be filed, there's no re reason to have stipulations regarding discovery filed. Right. Uh, now, it may be that if uh, that if the court does require discovery to be filed, that you might want to make a, a, an adjustment in that. Well, uh, what you've just described is significant, but I think frequently overlooked change in Rule 29. Yes. That it does yes. <laughs> enlarge the uh, And several scope. of the rules after that uh, pick back up on this same idea, yes. and they say, except is otherwise stipulated. So, for example, this... Uh, 25 interrogatories. Mm -hmm. uh, that may be included in the scheduling order. Nevertheless, if the parties agree that 30 is needed, fine. You don't have to come to the court. For it. The court can change it, uh, but but unless the court does so, the, the parties are free to do it themselves. So they're not, they're not really uh, grabbing a, the authority of the court. This is something the rule gives to them. It gets, really it's, uh, unburdens the I, court. I think one of the main things is to, hopefully we'll be able to do, is if we can start off with a meeting, get attorneys hopefully working together being reasonably cooperative and collegial. They come into the court for a scheduling conference. That is fostered. They are then encouraged to conduct uh, the further discovery in a way in which they are cooperative. Uh, hopefully some of the rules cut down on the contentiousness and the like. Hopefully we can do a better job than we have in the past. Uh, well, speaking of doing a good job, uh, the thought that runs through all of this is the crucial importance of getting the word out so that the lawyers that practice in the court, as well as the judges, know what's expected. The lawyers know what's expected of them. The judges know what is expected of the lawyers. And uh, that, that is the thought, of course, that we've expressed in various ways, that the rules should make it clear just exactly what the regime in the court will be. Uh, you have some thoughts on what courts might be doing to further this, besides what we have already said, to have a clear and understandable and uh, free of inconsistencies set of rules? Well, there's several things that we have done that I have seen in other districts that they are doing that it seems to me are, are very helpful. Uh, one is to have the local rules actually out in publication and available to the attorneys. I guess I'm a little uh, cautious here because particularly if some courts need to do some further work on their local rules <laughs> because it, they're in trouble right now and inconsistent, I'm not sure I really want to encourage too much circulation of those materials and just uh, create you wanna, you wanna problems. The, you want to wash the linen before we hang yeah. it out. Eh? Uh, but anyway, the, getting the local rules out. This, what we have done uh, is have a one-page summary of key changes. I've got one in front of me, it's a uh, yellow page front and back, and when the plaintiff files a case after November the 30th, the plaintiff gets a copy of this uh, for the plaintiff and for each defendant, and it's mailed to the defendants along with the summons. So every, and lawyers it, can carry it in their pockets like the Miranda warning. Well, I, <laughs> but it does highlight and make very clear, and uh, in, in, it doesn't take that many words, all of the different things that they need to know at the outset of the case and that will affect them. I think that can be a, is a helpful kind of thing to and, do. And Pat, you wrote an excellent summary of the provisions and new rules that the administrative office mailed out that all the courts should have that could be made available to lawyers. The, uh, there, there are a number of those uh, around, the, the summaries that I think are very, very useful. They're obviously, the other the usual resources that the uh, district court. Uh, now we have a lot of ends of court in uh, many, uh, these areas, which uh, take a good percentage of the, of the uh, trial bar. Uh, 
seminars at those end of the court, end of court programs built around the rule changes involving the judges who are used often members of those in. That's a possibility. The bar, the traditional bar associations, all of that has got to, all those resources have to be tapped, it seems to me, because there's a real problem of education. And, and uh, judges can save themselves a lot of headaches if they get the word out, for example, in the way that Rule 11 was changed, yes. so people know uh, and they're going to have to be told more than once, and it's going to take an effort. Similarly, so lawyers will know that now they're expected to waive service unless there's a good reason not to. So there's some significant rules uh, where education will save the court in the long run headaches. And what we are doing... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, those little mm -hmm. handouts with well, the bullets, I think, are just so yes. good because, for yes. example, that's saying, that's saying Rule 11 does not apply to discovery motions. That's, you, know, you, you don't file Rule 11 motions mm -hmm. complaining about discovery. That's something that simple, that direct, can save you a lot of headaches. One of the big things, though, is to try to get a handout that get, captures the local rule variation. Yes. The thing that you worked on, mm -hmm. Pat, and I've done some similar things, of course, was trying to deal with it nationally. Yes. And so that then gets rather confusing because it if you try to use it locally, it doesn't highlight what the local options are. Yes, so I think well, well, that's a good the point. courts need right. to do something locally. One thing we're doing is having a series of essentially one-hour seminars or workshops. Mm -hmm. uh, the attorneys come in tomorrow, for example, uh, which will be a Friday. We are having uh, a workshop at 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the federal building in Birmingham. Uh, we'll have them scheduled over the next several months at various times in the various divisional courthouses to work on it. It doesn't have to take long. An hour or so is, uh, gives you a pretty good feel for it, but it's, uh, it takes some work uh, to, make it, to make it work. Well, I want to thank you, both of you, for taking time from your busy schedule to help the center put this tape together. I hope that... Uh, you will find it helpful, and uh, thank you for joining us. Goodbye.